are listening to the Energy is Love podcast. I want you to, first and foremost, if you would, please, because I listened to your podcast and I was trying to make sure that I could pronounce your last name and rather than try to butcher it, and I don't even think it's that difficult of a last name, but if you wouldn't mind, please telling us how to pronounce your last name. It's Lansadel. Lansadel. So if okay. you think of the name Lance and the name Adele and you just blend them together, that's my last name. <laughs> <laughs> nice. I love it. Yeah. Uh, one thing that we like to do too is when we have somebody come on the podcast, rather than waiting until the end for them to share all of their stuff, yeah. let's share it up front so that people know how to find you, where to find you, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, wonderful. Uh, I think the best place would just be my website. So mattlancetal.com. Um, and my Instagram is inspired to be authentic. Those are pretty much the two best places to see what I'm about and, and what I'm up to. So what are you about, Matt? <laughs> what am I about? <laughs> <laughs> oh, geez. Um, I'm, I, I think I'm, I'm about love. Really, at the end of the day, my intention is love. And that's why I feel so much resonance with you guys. Like energy is love. It's what, what it's all about, right? And, um, you know, what I, what I really, my passion on, you know, in life is to help people move away from suffering. Um, there's been a lot of suffering in my life for different reasons. And um, I've found different recipes that help people move through the transformations to move towards authenticity, towards love, joy, peace, these sorts of things. And um, so I think that's kind of my main, my main objective is to just help people move through suffering. And, you know, I, I frame it as like the healing journey, because, you know, through the healing journey, there, there's lots of suffering, there is lots of love, there's lots of joy, there's, there's, there's a little bit of everything on the healing journey. So I kind of, I guide people um, psychologically and spiritually down that path. Oh, excuse me. <clears throat> For whatever reason, before we got started, and it's still here, I've got all this garbage <laughs> in my throat. Hopefully it won't uh, distract too much. Um, I'd like to get into your healing journey if we could. Okay. And the only reason being is one of the things that we really like doing on the podcast is, I mean, at the end of the day, we share the real world experience of what we're going through as a couple and what we're going through in our healing. Mm -hmm. And I think by sharing it as openly and as vulnerably as we can, and as we try to, then the people that listen resonate, they connect, you know, it's that whole thing of making people feel like they're not alone, yeah. especially in all of the trauma and all of the darkness and all of the stuff that we think is only us. Right. Yeah. And so if you wouldn't mind, let's just get into your healing journey and the experience of like, like, we're going to go straight at it, if that's okay. Yeah. But I have a really good <laughs> that's question. How I shoot you. <laughs> <laughs> what in your mind at this point in your life has been the most challenging thing to heal, to get over, to acknowledge, to see, to deal with? Hmm. Jeez. I've been through quite a few things. So I've, I've, you know, kind of list a few of them. Like my parents' divorce was pretty, pretty traumatizing for me, the kind of the, the breaking up of my family. Uh, I was about nine when that happened. Um, I've overcome a crack addiction, um, coming out as gay, being a sensitive man. These are kind of things. But I think the biggest, most challenging thing I've had to navigate would be healing codependency and the trauma that's associated with it, like the attachment trauma from my upbringing. Um, because it was in, it was infecting every area of my life, my relationships. I couldn't I couldn't hold down a solid relationship um, romantically, um, and even friendships were really hot and cold and push and pull. Um, just a lot of fear around being hurt and and not trusting people, and um, and then that brought up that the fawning response and and the people pleasing and all that energy and. Um, anxious attachment, disorganized attachment, all these things were so heavy for me to deal with. And, and just in the last three years, I've uh, done a lot of deep healing in this space. And um, I am proud to say I'm in my first secure relationship <laughs> and I'm 37. <laughs> so That's awesome. it feels really good to, to finally have some security. And that doesn't mean that it's all, you know, rainbows and butterflies. There's still things that come up, but I'm not, my nervous system is able to land and settle into the relationship. And I'm able to kind of maintain um, clarity of mind and clarity of heart while I'm uh, relating. So, yeah. 
just recently, like on our, we lose track because we do two episodes a week. And so I have no idea what episode it was. It was a recent episode, whether it was yeah. yesterday's episode or two weeks ago or something like that. But <laughs> we are in attachment. We are uh, diving into it in such a more complete full way. It's something that we're super aware of yeah. to some extent, right? There's always layers to it and layers to understanding it. Yeah. Um, but it's just recently come up more and more and more in our space. And we both have... <clears throat> I want to get into it more. I want to get into like attachment theories and the styles and your understanding of it and your relationship with it. Yeah. Stephanie and I both feel like we have like <laughs> the more that we uncover about ourselves, the more we realize we just have everything right. Yes. We're on every spectrum that exists. We yeah. <laughs> have all of these issues. We check all the boxes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's authenticity in my opinion, right? We're multitudinal. We are, we're, we're layered creatures. We can be anything and everything. Mm -hmm. Right. We just box ourselves in. Yeah. Yeah. It would be nice if we only had to check one box, right? Yeah. yeah. But it's all of them. And yeah. so for you, when did you first start having, you said about three years ago when you started working on it, was that around the same time that you started to even look in like codependency and dependency and attachment and mm -hmm. just that big broad scope of what all of that is? When did you start to have awareness of that and start to look at it? My very first relationship was eight years long. Um, and I was very avoidant. I didn't know that I had an avoidant attachment style at that time. And, um, and then I, I, that the breaking up of that relationship was very, very challenging for me. And it brought up a lot of grief and it made me connect back into my, my emotions essentially. And then I, because I was very repressed from the, the childhood trauma that I went through, I kind of dissociated. So I was very avoidant because I didn't have a connection to my emotions. My, that next relationship was probably one of the most challenging relationships I've been through. That was two years long and I was excessively anxiously attached. So all of my stuff came out from childhood in that relationship and it was being projected into the relationship. And that was when I realized um, that it was attachment issues. I, at first, I thought it was obsessive compulsive disorder. I, I, started, I was going to treatment uh, with a psychologist and I was working on OCD stuff. And um, I'm surprised that she did not pick up that, that it was attachment issues. And, and I was, I was uh, working with attachment trauma. Uh, but they show up very similarly because the preoccupation in the anxious attachment is perseveration. It's rumination. It's, it's you can't find here because you're so out there. And that was when I realized I'm also had a lot of codependency that I had to navigate. Um, so then the three relationships after that were all very challenging and they were all very anxious in flavor. Um, and then my last relationship before the one I'm in now, um, I realized that I'm actually fearful avoidant, which is a disorganized attachment style, which you, you flop, flop between anxious and avoidant. And it depends on the person that you're interacting with. So my partner, uh, my very first partner was anxious, so I was avoidant. And then my partners after that were more on the avoidance spectrum, so I became very anxious. Um, which I, I personally think that the disorganized attachment style or fearful avoidant is probably one of the most challenging attachment styles to have because there's so much confusion and uncertainty and, you know, you're just, it just feels like... Um, I was lost constantly. I didn't know who I was. I didn't know how, you know, how to navigate my relationships. And, um, and then the partner at that time was also fearful avoidant, which is interesting because we, we were mirroring, we were twin flames, I think. And we mirrored to each other, um, all of the stuff. And it was a really hard relationship, but we, the, he's the first relationship that I have maintained friendship with which is really cool. And that was a sign that I was progressing because I'm like, okay, I'm able to maintain um, connection with these, with this person. And um, so, that, yeah. And then that brought me down the path of uh, codependency healing and attachment trauma healing, working with my, the energy uh, cords with my parents, because that's where all this stuff originated. And um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm feeling a lot more clear now about, you know, my attachment. So I would say I'm probably 80% secure. I, this, the fearful avoidance stuff still comes up in different ways. Um, more specifically, um, I'm practicing non-monogamy right now. So there's still that the jealousy that can come up and the, <clears throat> the fear of abandonment. And what if my partner finds somebody uh, that they love more than me? Right. So that energy is still alive, but um, I'm being asked to work on that energy right now, which is why I'm being asked to be in a non-monogamous container. So 
Let's go back to childhood. Yeah. Uh, it's yeah. where Steph and I like to do a lot of work because, yeah, beautiful. Uh, right. It's a nightmare oftentimes, but <laughs> <laughs> we find so much gold there and so much healing there. And so when you start to learn the process or not even the process, but the concepts around attachment and codependency and everything like that, what are the pieces that you started to make and the connections that you started to make in regards to your parents and your upbringing and some of those experiences that you had that then helped under, you know, they helped you understand where you were at in your relationships today and kind of help in the healing process. Yeah. I think a lot of it was realizations around my parents' attachment styles and how that presented in mind. I think my dad's a blend between secure and avoidant and my mom <laughs> is definitely fearful avoidant and she does the push pull. And I experienced that a lot from her in my upbringing. And that was how I developed my fearful avoidance because I had a mother who would come in and love and then she would pull away, right, constantly. So it, it, it created this deep seated fear of being smothered and then a deep seated fear of being abandoned because there wasn't consistency in, in that attachment. And uh, like I said, my parents, there was a lot of, um, there was a lot of turmoil in my, in my, my family system. And um, I, my dad left when I was about nine and my mom was very emotionally volatile and kind of distraught a lot. And I took it on my shoulders to be the man of the house at like nine years old. And I think that was a big thing for me to, I learned very quickly to abandon my needs, uh, to take care of the needs of my mom and my sister. And, uh, and I just lost my sense of self. I, did, I didn't actually have that period where you individuate and you develop an authentic sense of self because my, I wasn't focusing on my needs. And that's how I think we develop an authentic sense of self is we focus on our needs and our boundaries. And uh, so I didn't get that period. So I really, what I've been doing, the work I've been doing is inner child work, reparenting work around providing myself the, I guess, safety and the, the focus on self to be able to develop that. And that's, I think, the work I've done in the last three years is, and now I'm a lot more clear about what I need and what I fear and what I, what my insecurities are, all these things, because my focus for so long was everyone else. And it's no surprise that I went into this field too. Like I did a counseling for, for 10 years and now I'm in life coaching and spiritual coaching, but it's all focus on other, right. And how to, to you know, move people along the journey. And um, since I've been embodying my own, you know, sense of self, I've become a, a lot better at what I do right because I'm now able to kind of bring forward my sense of self into the work that I do as well yeah do you have anything right off the bat babe how old were you when you started to self-medicate when you experienced your addiction oh geez I was I think I was 11 when I uh, first started drinking and smoking pot and then it went to uh, mushrooms at probably 13 and then ecstasy 14 and then I, by the age of 16, I was doing uh, Coke and then crack started at 17 till about 24. I, I had a crack addiction from 17 to 24. So pretty much like a lot of my upbringing. Yeah. 11. Yeah. That is it's where you lost yourself. That was what, so one of the things that um, I struggled with in finding like my own patterns on that is accepting the fact that um, as detrimental as that was, that that was an, it was a deep knowing of a survival instinct is that the environment that I was in was not survivable. So I found a way to survive. Now, granted, it is not a chosen one. And it's something that comes with a lot of pain and having to overcome, but just like that, a awareness that 11 year old you started to seek shelter in a sense, even though it created something that, you know, you had to save yourself from yet again, but yeah. what have you had time to sit with that and looking at the, basically the survival instincts and a way that you found to protect yourself without being able to identify with self at such a young age. Mm. Yeah. I think that's the fawning. That I, I became like, uh, the, you know, when, when trauma responses, like, you know, fight, flight, fawn, freeze, like these sorts of things, I was very much a fawner. Like I learned how to people please, I learned how to meet everybody else's needs. Uh, because 
I think I just had a real strong need to feel seen and feel understood and feel heard. And I didn't really get that when I was younger because um, there was such a preoccupation with my parents on their own emotions and their own, you know, the destruction of their own marriage. So I kind of went and my, a lot of my needs went unmet and I kind of just swallowed that, I think. And the fawning for me was how I became seen and heard and understood, but it was, it, the birthplace of it was out of self-abandonment and self-betrayal. Right. Mm -hmm. And so the, I equated self-abandonment and self-betrayal with getting my needs met. And that's how I was showing up in my relationships. I was so serving of my partners and I was not serving of myself. So I was attracting people who, who I wouldn't say they were narcissistic by any means, but they had that take energy. Right. And I had the give energy. So, and that's what I needed, right? I needed to be in that kind of dynamic to realize how I was abandoning myself. So, yeah. And I, you know, it's, it's interesting too, because I also have, I'm, I'm meeting a lot of empathy now in my life and forgiveness for my parents, because I'm, I'm now embracing the parts of me that I rejected, which one of them is being an empath. The other one is being highly sensitive. Both my parents are highly sensitive. And I also know how painful it is to, um, to experience the loss of a relationship. And they were in the, the throes of that, the destruction of their marriage, right? So it's like, there's, there's an element of me that I have compassion and I have empathy now. And I think that's been a lot of my healing is finding that because I was angry at them for so long and I wasn't able to fully let go and heal. Um, so yeah, it's, it's interesting now. I can kind of see things with a lot more clarity. Was your dad, did he remain a fixture in your life or when they got divorced, did he kind of like separate from you as well? No, he, so my father left um, and I didn't get to see him very often, but we did. And then I, at periods in the, um, you know, because I would move back and forth at some points and I would go live with him and then uh, for a couple of weeks and live with my mom. And that's kind of how I grew up. I was like basically living out of a suitcase and um, so I did get to stay connected with him, which I'm very grateful for. And, um, and we, we actually recently had a, a conversation about the day that he left and it was really painful for both of us, you know, like for him to, to have to leave, like he was completely devastated. And, uh, I got to rewrite that story when I, when I could see how emotional he was around, around that. And that, that was the only choice, right. That he had. So um, so our relationship now is, uh, is a lot, uh, a lot better. Um, he's not a very emotional guy, <laughs> like at least his displays of emotion, but he's very, very intellectual. And we, we, we connect on that level, which is, which is really beautiful. Yeah. Have you had any, cause part of what I've done and <laughs> it's an ongoing process, right? It's not something that I've mastered by any means, but over the course of the last several years and healing and understanding and diving into the past and going into the shadow of all sorts of different things, um, my, my internal relationship that I have with my parents, not necessarily the external, the actual relationship that takes place, but the internal relationship that I have with each one of them. My parents were divorced when I was 14, and um, some of your story mirrors quite similar to mine, mm. but this internal like relationship that I have with my parents and my role in regards to that relationship, I think has evolved and changed over the course of history and time, obviously externally in the real you know, way that it plays out. But I'm more curious about if you have awareness of that kind of internal dialogue and that internal relationship. And what I mean by that, I guess, to give it a little bit more context is um, I have like we take upon the, we take our parents on and we um, align with them in some way, shape or form, consciously and subconsciously, right? I have these qualities of my dad or I have these qualities of my mom. Mm -hmm. And over the course of life, we, we like those things or sometimes we don't like those things or we see those things as positives and then we see those things as negatives. What's that relationship like now for you as you have done a copious amount, copious amounts of this healing, but that internal relationship of how you see 
those dynamics of their shit playing out in your life and your experiences and the relationship between all of that internally within you, right? Because I think at the end of the day, this is a super long question, Matt. <laughs> um, I'm with you though, I'm with you. Yeah. Okay, I think at the end of the day, that kind of internal relationship and dialogue and struggle is one that just never goes away, right? We're gonna have mm -hmm. that thing forever because these parents of ours birthed us and gave life to us. And undoubtedly, it's going to be something that we deal with the rest of our life, right? So where's that relationship at now? Oh, yeah, that is a big question. Um, and, you know, it's so it's so interesting, because this is this is, in my opinion, the embodiment of shadow work, because we the shadows for many of us are the aspects of ourselves that were integrated into us by our parents that we right. And that's why for a lot of us, our parents trigger the shit out of us. <laughs> because we're just seeing in them unintegrated aspects in ourselves. And I think, you know, for me, um, my mother's fearful avoidance, the push pull, the hot cold that is in me too. Right. And um, it's caused me so much pain in my relationship. So I had so much anger and I was projecting on that onto her and not taking responsibility for my own attachment style. So that would be one of them for sure. Um and the other one would be my dad's uh, high sensitivity as well, because he gets overstimulated easily and then he has to take care of himself. And uh, I experienced that as abandonment a lot when I was younger. And, um, but I also do the same thing, <laughs> right, in my relationship. So th these are two huge ones that I've integrated just recently. Um, and it's set me free. And it's, you know, it's allowed me to really understand them and have compassion and empathy for them. Um, yeah, I, I'll leave it there because I think that's that pretty much answers it fully for me. Yeah. <clears throat> the other thing I wanted to ask you and see if um see if I can try to form it. My questions are obviously super. <laughs> they're not even questions. I don't even know what the fuck they are. <laughs> There's just long, elaborate uh, words coming out of my mouth to try to articulate something. The you talked earlier about um, substance abuse and. Uh, addiction and everything like that. Uh, the way that I've started to kind of process and think about these coping mechanisms that we have is there's a lot of conscious coping mechanisms that we like layers to it, right? We can see some really conscious coping mechanisms. And sometimes they're the easy ones that society labels as coping mechanisms and addictions and substance abuse, alcohol, porn, um, money, all, gambling, all of these ones that society has kind of like acknowledged as things that people do to deal with the inability of their emotions inside, right? Or the yeah. inability to deal with their emotions. <clears throat> and then there's like all sorts of subconscious coping mechanisms and all sorts of things that are running behind the scenes and underneath everything. So we address all of these surface level ones at first and kind of make peace with them, develop a relationship and an awareness and start to incorporate healthier uh, lifestyles and healthier coping mechanisms. And yeah. that's all that some people do. And there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. Do you have awareness of any of the other subconscious things that have been happening and that might still be happening that are kind of running in the background? Because we, I try to oversimplify things, Matt, <clears throat> because my brain can't grasp the like gravity of some things right it's just too much stuff too big and so in my mind <clears throat> my nervous system gets dysregulated and then i have conscious ways of regulating it and i have subconscious ways yeah and i'm trying more and more and more and more and more to recognize all of the subtle subconscious things that i do yeah. and sometimes they're 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 literally just thought processes. Like sometimes I have a similar narrative or a thought process that is a coping mechanism to disassociate from whatever my nervous system is experiencing. Yeah. So it hasn't led to an external addiction or an external coping mechanism. It's like my brain's way <laughs> of, it's almost like a, a positive affirmation that we would tell ourselves consciously. Yeah. My subconscious has got a quote unquote in its mind, positive affirmation to direct itself away from this negative dysregulation that's taking place because of this emotion. Mm -hmm. Does that all, does that all make sense? 
Yeah, yeah, I definitely uh, can relate. Um, you know, I kind of categorize it as like behavioral coping mechanisms and then psychological coping mechanisms. And I think, you know, for me, you know, the behavior would be like sex, porn, drugs, alcohol, gambling, work, all of these things. And then um, the, the psychological for me would be things like projection, denial, blaming, uh, rumination, dissociation, these sorts of things. And I think that's, um, I definitely played both of them and uh, even at times still I do, right? Like I love eating and scrolling on my phone when I'm, you know, feeling emotional <laughs> and I don't want to have to be with myself. And I think it's, it, it can be healthy to take breaks from yourself as long as you are conscious about it and you come back to yourself. That's the key, right? But there's times in my day where I'm like, I can't be with myself right now. It's too intense. It's too much. Uh, so I need to take a break from myself. Um, but the ones that I've been really trying to pinpoint and be a bit more deliberate with is things like um, dissociation, um, which is like, a, which is disconnecting from my body, essentially, I experience my emotions in my body, we all do. And I think, you know, so what I do is I ruminate, right. And that's when I know things are highly emotional and things need to be tended to when my mind won't stop and my mind's perseverating the wheel spinning right that means that I am probably edging with dissociation and I need to come back into my body and I need to experience my emotions um and you know, I, I, I'm also kind of grappling with this whole concept of like, we can't make our emotions flow. I can't make my emotions flow. I can, all I can do is I can remove the dams that I'm, that I've built, which is these coping mechanisms. Right. And as soon as I stop doing those things, my emotions can flow. But I went through a period where I was trying to make my emotions flow and it got very frustrating for me. And that was just this, my ego or my, my mind trying to govern a process that it has no business with, which is my body, the embodiment of my emotions. And um, so I've been learning how to get out of my own way, right? And um, oftentimes what my fearful avoidant attachment style wants to do is it wants to, it wants to ruminate. And it wants to punish people from a distance. Um, and what I've been learning to do is I've been learning to bring that energy into connection and talk about it and be vulnerable and be expressive. And when I do that, I'm able to connect with my emotions and I'm able to discharge them. Um, and I, I learned, you know, a part of my programming is I learned from a young age that no one can support me emotionally. I have to do it all on my own, right? So that's been a big learning for me. And that's how my relationship has been secure in the early stages is because I'm bringing everything into the connection, which is very new for me. <laughs> so it's been good. <laughs> yeah. Scary though. Yeah. Oh man. Yeah. It's very scary, but it's, you know, I'm, I'm in a relationship with a guy right now who has done his work or I shouldn't say done his work, doing his work. We're all doing our work and, uh, and he holds beautiful space and he's very trustworthy. He's very consistent. He's very transparent you know, things that my attachment style need in order to settle in. And I think that's really important to me. With um, like one of the, the struggles, especially with a, an addictive personality, which comes into play is getting hyper-focused on the perception of healthy behaviors, the, <clears throat> the way that we explain it to ourselves when we're really getting completely, we're disassociating with obsessive distractions that we're masking as healthy yeah. behaviors. Do you find yourself like becoming obsessive over healthy choices? That's not really, it's just where you've found a new way to check out without having to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That was the story of my life because when I came out of my addiction at 24, I became obsessed with fitness and nutrition and mm -hmm. I projected all my stuff, my perfectionism, my shame, my trauma all got projected into that. And uh, I've actually, I'm on a, I'm on a three year hiatus away from fitness. I stopped working out because I was so obsessed with it. I would, I would weigh myself every morning, every night. I had little logs that would track everything. Um, I wouldn't go out for, for dinners with friends because I couldn't track the calories. Like that's how, how bad it got for me. And, um, 
Uh, so I basically packed up my stuff uh, in storage and I moved to Asia for a year and I lived in Thailand and Vietnam and I just deconstructed all of this crap that I had inherited around my body, my body image. And, you know, that's where I, I basically went into like kind of the bowels of my shadow and like worked on all this stuff that was feeding my desire to escape myself. Cause you're right. Like it doesn't matter if it's healthy or unhealthy, it's still escapism, right? It's just maybe the outcome is not going to be as harmful, right? But it still was very harmful. I did a lot of damage to my body, um, I'm still healing injuries that I accumulated over those, you know, 10 years of excessive uh, working out. So yeah, what, what was healthy in, in, you know, theory turned out to be very damaging to my body. And it's just kind of, you know, the whole moral of the story is like, you know, anything outside of moderation can be harmful, right? We always have to be keeping balance in our lives. And um, so I learned that lesson in a big way. And uh, I'm now working with an athletic therapist and getting the kind of my body primed and ready to get back into doing that. Cause I love that side of things too. I love feeling strong. I love feeling um, fit, but I'm, I have to be really careful with that obsession around it and, um, and doing it for the intention of feeling good and, uh, and not being obsessed with my appearance and how I look. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> one of the things that um, at least has been our experience and our understanding of it, and it's a massive oversimplification, but the whole idea is as you continually dive into the shadow and reveal and discover and heal and bring awareness to, right, the, the shadow basically evolves along with you. And so as you heal and as you go through the process of uncovering all of this stuff, it's not a matter of there's always more stuff. Yes, there is, right? There's always more layers of that onion to kind of peel back and dive into. And yeah. maybe not the, necessarily the shadow, but like the ego, the part of it that is trying to manipulate and keep us small and all the narratives that we have inside of our head and that self-dialogue, we have found that it just evolves right along with us and gets more and more creative in the ways that it chooses to like fuck with you and mm -hmm use what you are like what you just said right fitness and this thing that was seemingly a good thing um eventually turns and you have awareness of it but what else has i mean i guess first and foremost do you agree with that and then what have you noticed has how has that played out right where you evolve and you heal and you continue on this beautiful journey but then right along with you is this ego that is evolving with you to try to do what it does Mm -hmm. <laughs> you guys are asking like the most perfect questions. I love it because this is all the stuff I'm navigating. So it's like, it's very alive for me. Um, you know, I will, I can confidently say I've pretty much integrated all my shadows. Um, but what I mean by that is they're integrated. They're now in me with consciousness. Doesn't mean that they're dissolved and that I'm just, I'm all love and light. It just means that I'm now aware of them. And before my ego was, very strong and it was the negotiator between my authentic self and my shadow self which they had never met each other they were very very separate and my ego was this kind of middleman that would negotiate and it would only tell my authentic self the things that it needed that that it wanted to hear right so there was so much in in my shadows that i wasn't aware of and that's where i was acting out from and i was unconscious and i think now i'm kind of I'm learning to befriend my ego now because I've, I've integrated shadow, right? And I've done a lot of work in that space and a lot of healing. My shadow work taught me how much I needed to heal. That's really what, what it showed me. And then now I went through a period where I developed a spiritual ego and it was very, very strong. Um, and it was, you know, a lot of bypassing. And a lot of like, oh, ego death and, you know, kill the ego and all that energy. And it was like, you know, that's really toxic in the spiritual community, I think, because the ego is a really important part of who we are, right? Um, we, I always say like a, an unconscious ego is dangerous, but a conscious ego is actually your friend and you need to prime it and you need to kind of work with it. And I think that really is inner child work, in my opinion, it's befriending the ego and learning how to not be at odds with yourself anymore. 
because if we think about ego and like the psychology of ego, it's, it's ego formation happens in childhood. So a lot of our ego are, is this kind of more childlike energy that, you know, it, it, it is, it, it works in extremes, just like a child would. Right. Um, so I'm kind of going through a process and have been over the last, you know, three or four years around, um, befriending that part of me. And, uh, I don't, my goal now is not ego death. It's, uh, shedding of, of ego skin. So my ego can move from rigidity to flexibility. And I think every time I have this, you know, these big kind of purges or these nervous system activations that come up for me and I have to surrender to those, those experiences, whether they're life circumstances or conflicts with people. Um, and I choose humility uh, and flexibility over rigidity, then my ego sheds a skin and it allows it to be more flexible. And then my relationships benefit, my relationship with myself benefits, my relationship with the universe benefits, right? So I just think that that's, <clears throat> that's how I experience it. At least I'm not going to speak for anybody else because maybe there are people, you know, I know Eckhart Tolle talks about, you know, ego death and that sort of thing. And, you know, I love, I love his work. And my, my first book that I wrote was basically inspired by the power of now. Um, but I, that's where I don't agree with his philosophy is, is around ego death, because I feel like we need the ego in order to be able to um, navigate our way through life. Right. Yeah, we totally agree. It's one of those yeah. things where, like you said, there's so much of that bypassing that's taking place and so much mm. of that avoidance yeah. of, you know, and I, I think of it too, as like, so micro macro, right? There's an ego that exists externally within the whole stratosphere of everything in society yeah. and community and everything like that. And it's like a beautiful way that it's mastered. Don't look at me and don't heal me and don't address me, right? Just bypass, yeah. just, yeah. just kill me and yeah. I'll move on and you'll be better. And by doing so, we alleviate any, like, you know, it can still run under the surface. And it's almost kind of like, um, like the religious undertones of uh, God and Satan and, you know, Satan's greatest, um, what was it like the, like his biggest accomplishment is getting people to not believe in him or something like that. Oh, Maybe yeah. I'm totally butchering that. Do you know what I'm talking about? I'm sorry. There? I don't have that one. <laughs> <laughs> but similar thing, right? It's like, yeah, kill your yeah. ego is yeah. exactly what your ego wants you to think it, you know, it's not only what you need to do, but that that's a possible thing. Yes. Yeah. When um, <clears throat> I love that you're doing like so much work that it's one of those things that we really gravitate and resonate with people that are in that process, mm -hmm. simply because that's where we're at. And I think it's something that is so massively important and necessary. Yeah. And <clears throat> what is not just what is coming up for you right now, but more specifically, what's in your space right now that you uh, are struggling with and that you are having a difficult time with? Because we have healing practices and we have things that we're doing and healthy coping mechanisms. We're doing all of this work, mm -hmm. but there's always, I think, something in our space that is maybe the next level of, of evolution or the next level of healing that we're in the midst of kind of struggling and butting up against yeah. that we're resistant to kind of looking at. What is that for you? Hmm. I would say trust. <clears throat> it's not something that comes easy for me. So trusting self, trusting other, I feel pretty good in that space, but I'm still learning how to trust the universe and more so from a scarcity abundance perspective, like trusting that there's enough, trusting that I'm taken care of. Um, like I said, there's been a lot of struggle in my life. And I think, you know, my, I'm an old soul. I know that for sure. And I think I chose this life to, and I took a lot on my plate, <laughs> right? And <clears throat> so I, I kind of, my ego does not like that, but my soul's like, yeah, you're a warrior. This is amazing. But my ego's like, oh, more suffering. Oh, more this, oh, more that. So I'm, I'm, I'm always negotiating between those two. Um, so I would say that's one of them. And then the other one would be learning unconditional love. That's really alive for me right now because a lot of the love I've practiced in my life has been attachment um, disguised as love. And I think, I'm learning how to embody freedom in love, um, you know, and I'm, I work with this mantra every morning, um, you are free, I hold my hand up, hand on my heart, and then I am free. 
which for me, a, a, that's a bit, that's a big thing for me because I've always been so preoccupied with other people. So when I think about my partner being free, I think about what is he going to do with his freedom? And I, that's where my focus is. And now I'm like, I have freedom. Wow. What am I going to do with my freedom? Do you know? And, and, and I'm really celebrating that. And, um, and there's an element of trust that plays into that too, because it's like, well, if I give my partner freedom or my partner takes freedom, I should say, um, will he come back or will he find something better? Right. So there's this really powerful relationship between trust and love that I'm learning right now. And whew, emotion is coming through. Um, that's, it's just, uh, it just feels really good, I think, because I'm really, I'm really tasting, I think, what we're meant to experience in this life. I'm finally tasting it, right? And as I've been working my butt off to get to this point, and it just feels nice to be able to, um, to be in that place, I think. Yeah. And there's still work to be done. And I, I, I see that, right? And I'm, I'm very aware of that. And I, I also am aware that it probably will never end. And that's why I'm learning also to um, make, have fun, have fun with it. My journey is, this is, this is what I do. This is what I embody. I, I do deep, deep work. And then I bring that work and that the presence of the transformation into my, my work. Right. And that's just, that's my, that's my life purpose. That's what my soul called into this life. So there's an element of acceptance around that, that, you know, I'm going to be uh, working through suffering and working, but I've learned how to suffer from such a conscious place uh, now that it's like, I almost feel neutral to suffering. I don't really get thrown off by it anymore because I've been through it so much and I've changed my relationship with suffering that now it's like, I just, it's just part of it. It's just, I just go through it and I surrender to it. And I, then at the end, I benefit from the transformation that came out of that perceived suffering. Right. What's your, um, <clears throat> What's your relationship like when it comes to trust in yourself? Hmm. Very strong right now. I'm like, I'm really in this energy. Um, just really this, this real powerful energy right now. Like nothing can throw me off course. That's where I'm at right now. And I'm very boundaried. Um, I speak my truth with ease and grace. Um, and I think that's why is because I've learned how to trust myself. And it happened because I started to focus on my needs and my desires and started to meet those. And, you know, my inner child is, it started to trust me again, because I started to reparent it and care for it and be consistent with it and transparent with it, right? All the things that my disorganized attachment wanted in a partner, consistency, transparency, honesty, vulnerability, that's what I had to offer myself, right? My inner child didn't get those things growing up. So when I started to offer that, my inner child was like, ah, okay, I can now trust you. And that's, that's how I'm experiencing self-trust is there, those two parts of me have become one and I'm, they, you know, there's just a, so it's like, that's, that's all another thing too, is I'm very much prioritizing me, right? What am I going to do with my freedom? Focus on me. Everything's about me right now. And for a lot of people, you know, we come from a, a world where they might perceive that as selfish or self-centered, but you know, if somebody who's lived their whole life as a codependent, you have to go through that, like that reclamation process where you are the center of your universe right? Because for your whole life, everyone else has been the center of your universe. So I'm kind of, you know, and I feel pretty balanced with that. Like I'm still very much tending to others needs and stuff. So I feel like I found like a really nice sweet spot with that. Go ahead. <clears throat> Go ahead. No, no, you're oh. good. Um, I'm glad you were talking about boundaries. One of the things like with uh, ego spirituality can be toxic in is unconditional love. Yeah. And unconditional love can be used as, um, like as a weapon mm -hmm. and how they are proclaiming it. Unconditional love, like it's, you have, you have no boundaries is basically how they portray it is if you are really loving me unconditionally, if you are really showing up as yourself, then there are no boundaries. So how did you navigate that 
and to where like, I can love unconditionally, but that does not mean that I am without boundaries where you're still honoring yourself and people get to make their own choices, but you also get to choose on what's in your space. Yeah. Good question. Um, I actually posted something this morning on, on Instagram. I did a reel about divinity and personality and how personality is an ego structure and divinity is a soul structure and unconditional love for me is recognizing the divinity in somebody else and choosing to love that. Uh, it doesn't mean that I have to agree with their personality or even have to negotiate or even interact with their personality. I can love somebody from a distance. So for me, it's like, the interaction isn't as relevant when you're when you're practicing unconditional love as just the intention behind wanting choosing to, to see somebody uh, somebody's energy right and choosing to see somebody's loving nature uh, and so for me that's kind of what I'm experiencing and by you're very right because when I my ego doesn't like that term <laughs> unconditional love because <laughs> it's like well, if I'm going to love someone unconditionally, they're going to treat me like shit, or they're going to betray me and all that. That's where, right? Again, the ego, it does a very good job at separating. And the soul does a really good job at unifying. And uh, so I think that's, that's what I'm learning is how to discern. And uh, when I'm when I'm working with somebody's personality or interacting with somebody's personality, boundaries are very, very important. Because you're showing them, okay, this is how I need your personality to show up to work with my personality. So I think when we're when we're interacting with personality to personality, boundaries are really important. Soul to soul, I don't know if it's as important because the soul doesn't have an ego structure, which is like self-serving, meet my needs, you know, hidden agendas, these little cunning things that the ego does to try and get its needs met, manipulation right? That, that doesn't exist in, in soul to soul interaction. So I just think that that's what I'm moving more towards, right? And when I start to embody that in myself, you know, soul based consciousness or soul based connect, connection to self, my vibration attracts those people too, right? People like you people like, I'm just in this energy right now of attracting like people who are more soul centric, as opposed to egocentric. And, uh, so it makes it easier, right? So when I'm practicing unconditional love, I attract people who also want to practice unconditional love, which is that soul-based love. And I think that's kind of how I'm experiencing it right now. Do you have any sticking point in um, <clears throat> any relationships in your life right now where that dynamic is kind of playing out and you're struggling with it in a sense? The, the ego, mean you mean? Just that, <clears throat> that aspect of like, <clears throat> yes, I can see their personality and how they're showing up and I can see the unconditional love, the soul aspect of it, but I'm having uh, tension or I'm having hmm. um, a, a struggle, an issue with that relationship and trying to navigate that relationship. To be honest, I don't really feel that right now, but what I do do is because there's a lot of divisiveness on the planet right now. And there's a lot of stuff that are ha- that's happening right now. And I have very strong opinions about my personality has very strong opinions about what's going on. Um, and when I see people kind of projecting their shadows on social media and stuff, there is that judgmental part of me that comes up and is like, Oh, this person, like, how could they think like that? You know, like, and all that energy. Um, but I have a, I have a skill and I've always had this, even when I was younger to be able to kind of see the inner child in everybody. So whenever I see somebody spouting or, or spewing their shadows, I just, I picture them as like a five-year-old child. And I'm like, this person's in fear, right? Like, and, and I'm able to see that very, very distinctly. And when somebody's in fear, I know they're in ego and I know they're looking to separate to, to find safety. That's what the ego does. And I think so what I do is I just offer love. I offer compassion when I can. <laughs> Sometimes I offer other things, <laughs> but that's part of my human nature, right? Too, and I just, I laugh with myself when I'm like that because, um, you know, my moods are definitely, they impact my ego. So if I'm in a really bitter mood, then yeah, I might have hateful thoughts towards this person, but I'm very aware of it, right? And I try and check it when I can. Yeah. <coughs> How does that portray to yourself 
when you catch yourself in a moment of, I guess, your personality, which you, you wouldn't consciously choose, but you reactively chose, are you looking at yourself in the same and seeing yourself as that, that little child and giving yourself the same compassion, or does it take a little while to get there sometimes? That's such a great question. And I never even thought about that. Um, I think I'm, I'm harder on myself. Yeah. yeah, I have a harder time offering myself compassion. Um, but I, I kind of am in this energy of like, and I attribute this to my shadow work, because I when I integrated my shadows, I, I gave myself space to be that. Right. And I think I am a bit ferocious. And when I'm triggered or activated, I have a sharp tongue and I can be really nasty. And I'm aware of this part of my personality. And uh, I now offer myself awareness, maybe. And maybe now I'm learning how to offer myself compassion and awareness, because the awareness is like, ah, I see what's going on. I'm, I'm playing this out, right? And I need to play this out right now for some sort of you know, evolutionary experience, right? So I think what I'm now learning is how to bring in compassion for that process too, right? That we're all evolving through activation, through triggers, right? And we're all playing, um, we're all playing the villain in other people's stories, <laughs> right? Or the hero, right? Depending, right? And uh, when when you, when we play, when somebody else plays the villain in our stories, I, I, I'm aware of that. I'm like, oh, okay, this person needs to trigger me because something needs to be brought into the light. And I think if more and more humans realize that, that we would be less inclined to reject that experience because we know that that is the meat that elevates our consciousness and evolves us, right? Is the activations that we receive from other people. But if we can do it from a conscious and loving place, then we don't separate from one another, we unify or we separate for a period of time, but then we come back into unity, right? Depending on how severe the activation is. But yeah, so to answer your question more directly, I would say it's still something I'm working on. Yeah, to be a bit more compassionate with myself and offer myself space to, to be activated. Go ahead. No, go ahead. I was going to say, what does that, um, you're working on that? What does that look like? How are you working with that, giving yourself compassion? What is? Hmm. I think feeling feeling it comes it all comes back to feeling <laughs> right i'm noticing that it's all coming back to feeling and um because when i'm activated again like i said before i would dissociate i would ruminate i would do all these things and it's just dancing around the 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 issue or the feeling and when i go to the center of it it's like i enter that fire and it just burns it up you know so i'm like compassion for me would be to slow down and give myself space to feel and to take it one step further, slow down, give myself space to feel, but then take those feelings into connection because that's where the healing happens for me, right? My ego doesn't want that. My ego doesn't want anybody to know that they've activated me, right? So I will just be stoic. No, you can't get under my skin. That's a huge game my ego plays. And um, when, I, when I do let people know that they've gotten under my skin, I enter humility and humility softens my ego and humility is a really beautiful place that I can experience my emotions from. So it's all kind of part and parcel. Well, we're going to wrap up Matt, because uh, mm -hmm. you've been super generous with your time and also mm -hmm. just how you've shown up and how you've shared. Uh, before we go, though, I want to ask you a big question. <laughs> <laughs> Where do you see, like you said, there's so much that's going on in the world today, right? Mm -hmm. And I, I, I don't think it's any different than any other time period in, in history. Yeah. There's always so much going on in the world. And there's always yeah. so many, so many things and issues, good and bad, and all sorts of different stuff. And I think it seems a little bit more intense right now, merely because of how much awareness we have, where we've True. never had this much insight into what's going on everywhere, right? Mm -hmm. We only, you know, up until maybe even 20 years ago, we really kind of only had awareness of what was going on within a small realm of our life and our experiences. And now it's global yeah. in such a really daily way, right? Where do you see, maybe this is too big of a question, but 
like from your perspective and from where you sit and from your experience, where do you see it all heading? Hmm. I think you're very right. And I think we are a very, we're at probably the, the, the peak right now that we've ever been as, as far as human consciousness of having awareness, both individual and collective awareness. And I think we're moving through a period right now where we're doing collective shadow work. So everything's coming to the surface. And, and if I relate my own shadow work journey to the collective work, it's like, there was this period of like not wanting to meet myself. Then I just got closer and closer and closer. And then once I did, it was like this big messiness that occurred. And then I had to go through the messiness and I had to start extrapolating and healing and doing this. So I don't think this is going to be over anytime soon. <laughs> I will say that shadow work is a very arduous and drawn out process for a lot of people. So I think that we're going to be moving through this um, for a while. But I do see. I'm seeing this in my coaching, actually, the masculine feminine is becoming the distance between the two is becoming less and less. I think that's a big part of our shadow work right now. The balance between masculine and feminine energies within the individual is becoming more integrated. And that's bringing up a lot of shame for a lot of men and women, actually. But as men are being asked to meet their feminine, it's causing a lot of shame, um, which I'm working with a lot in my practice. Um, and then once these sorts of things, and I think relationship structures too, like the way we, we relate, I think monogamy has been such a, a traditional way of relating. And I think it's beautiful. I love monogamy, but there's also elements of other relationship structures that are coming to the forefront too. Um, and I just think that we're flipping the me to we, and we're starting to taste unity consciousness. And I think um, that's what I see coming is community and um, not these, you know, the people rising up and not being so susceptible to uh, mind control and to uh, monopolies by corporations. And I think we're going to come back to a little bit more of like a um, just working together as, as communities and not being so top heavy coming down on us and the oppression and that systemic patriarchal uh, capitalistic kind of mentality. I think that's going to start to soften. Um, but I think there's going to be a ton of resistance to that process happening, but the light will always win and prevail over that kind of darker energy, in my opinion. So it's going to be a bit like, but it's going to happen. I, I have settle full in. faith. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. One of the, I totally agree with you. I think that the, especially the masculine and feminine, I think that that's been, I know for us, personally, like in our own space and our own journey and our own experience in the last several years, that's kind of been the undercurrent and really the um, focus of everything. If we really broke it down, right. Just the blending of those two things and those two energies, both internally with uh, in ourselves, as well as in our relationship and all those kind of different dynamics playing out. One of the things, and <clears throat> this is like totally self-serving for just me and myself, <clears throat> But um, my hope, I'll plant this seed in, in, in a sense for the people that are listening, because this decisive, the divisiveness that's at play and the struggle that's happening in regards to so many different aspects across the globe that we see, the, the intention for me that I have internally and that I hope people can also grab some portion of it Mm -hmm. is if we can start to see it as less about a struggle or less about a, uh, an internal battle or a war and more about just the, the realities of the blending of two things of light and dark, right? I don't think the sun rises each day in a struggling, combative, way of trying to like oppress the darkness and mm -hmm. you know the the sun isn't coming up each day in opposition to the moon totally. the, the the sun allows the moon to still shine and show up even in darkness or even in light yeah and that whole thing of like we have to fight against this oppressiveness or fight against the patriarchy or fight against all of these things and we have to rise up to resist to me, that is the, that's the pattern and the cycle 
that I think has to shift and change to where we recognize that it's not a struggle and it's not a, a battle and a competition and we don't have to fight fire with fire, that it just is a simple allowance of the process to unfold, right? The, the, the light and the dark. I don't know. The, the yin and the yang. I like yeah. that. I think there's an element of exposure that has to happen right of the shadow of the darkness because i think you're right like the moon is conscious the sun is conscious and they give each other the space but if the moon was unconscious and it tried to take over the sun right so that's that's what's happening right now i think the restoration of consciousness between the dark and the light but you're i think you're very right and we all have it in us we all have darkness and we all have light in us and the more we repress that darkness the more it wreaks havoc in our lives and the more we embrace the darkness, the more we're able to almost like train it or like work with it. So it's not going to be taking over. Right. Yeah, you make a great point. Anything else, babe, before we wrap up? No? Matt, is there anything you'd like to throw out before we? I just want to say you guys, you know, I've been on many podcasts and I have two of my own and you guys hold a really beautiful space. You're both very... Um, just warm you have a warmth both of your voice like the way you speak and I, yeah it, it was really a pleasant experience and I wanted to just thank you guys for that holding you hold really beautiful space that's the best way to sum it up so thank you thank you mm -hmm. thank you so much mm -hmm. we'll share all your stuff in the show notes and everything like that and uh, what are what are your two podcasts so people can go listen to those as well uh, gay men going deeper is I work predominantly with, uh, or one half of my business is gay men. And then I work with empaths and highly sensitive people. And that podcast is called inspired to be authentic. Awesome. Well, thank you again. I really, really appreciate it. And appreciate you showing up.